Hello, everyone. This is Ben Norton. You are watching Propaganda Today. And everyone who's watching here can get a sneak peek at an article that I've been working on where I'm going to publish very soon at the Gray Zone. It's kind of long, but it's an in-depth account into this guy here. You can see the working headline I might change is how elite U.S. institutions created Afghanistan's corrupt neoliberal president, Ashraf Ghani, who robbed his own failed puppet regime. And here you can see the photos. On the left, this is this is Ashraf Ghani with the war criminal, uh, former U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, who was Secretary of State under Bill Clinton. And she famously was asked in a 60-minute interview if she thought that it was worth the U.S. sanctions, uh, the U.S.-led U.N. sanctions regime killing over, over half a million Iraqi children. And she said, yes, the price is worth it. In the middle here, you can see Ashraf Ghani as an invited honorable guest at the NATO summit. And he's meeting with Obama, who has a grin. And then here in the right side, you can see Ashraf Ghani. He was an invited guest, an honorary guest, and he gave a speech to the joint session of Congress in 2015. And you can see behind him, of course, he's being applauded by Joe Biden, who at the time was VP and, of course, is now president. This article goes through the history of Karzai. And I'll just read the, the summary here, the, the subhead kind of summary. Before he stole $169 million and fled his failed state in disgrace, Afghanistan's puppet president, Ashraf Ghani, was formed in elite American universities, given U.S. citizenship, trained in neoliberal economics by the World Bank, glorified in the media as a, quote, incorruptible technocrat, and coached by powerful D.C. think tanks like the Atlantic Council. So the summary of this article is I go through and I show how Karzai was completely a product made in the USA, made in USA. He might as well have that stamped on his forehead. He was a U.S. citizen. He spent over half of his life in the United States before the U.S. invaded in October 2001. He worked at elite universities. He was trained at elite universities. He worked at the World Bank, which is basically, as political economist Michael Hudson says, it's basically just a, an office in the basement of the Defar Department of Defense. It's an arm of the Pentagon. And he was totally an asset who, after the US military invasion, he was brought back to Afghanistan in December 2001. And immediately he was promoted to finance minister. And as finance minister, he was a complete neoliberal Chicago boy. He was, as I, as I say, he was basically like the, the Afghan version of Milton Friedman. Or as I argue in the piece, he was actually kind of like the Afghan Pinochet in the sense that Pinochet was, of course, a, a hard right, far right neoliberal who privatized everything and implemented the Washington consensus. But the difference is that Pinochet was this fascist dictator who had to use an iron fist to massacre, to slaughter anyone with a left wing bone in their body. He threw them out of helicopters. He committed just, just basically a politicide, people call, a genocide against anyone on the left with U.S. backing. He let all these former Nazis run concentration camps and these camps where they abused children and were trafficking children and there was just child rape and all these horrible atrocities. Well, the U.S. learned from the Pinochet experience that, that it did a lot of damage to their brand, their imperial brand, and they wanted someone who could implement Pinochet's economic policies but who could do it without the iron fist of his fascist regime. And Ashraf Ghani is a good example of that. So instead, they had the, the U.S. military and NATO military forces. They were the iron fist on behalf of Ashraf Ghani. And Ashraf Ghani was their neoliberal technocrat in Kabul who could implement all of the neoliberal policies that they had wanted for so long. So I begin this article talking about how he, he fled as the Taliban took over his country and his puppet regime that was, that was constructed over 20 years, it, it collapsed literally in days. And as the Taliban was taking over, he fled. And according to multiple people, including his former ambas his own ambassador, 
said that he stole $169 million fleeing the country with four cars and a helicopter. And then he went to the United Arab Emirates, one of the most corrupt countries on earth, an absolute monarchy, just a, a feudal dystopia with modern day slavery backed by the Western imperial powers. And they gave him so-called asylum on humanitarian grounds in scare quotes. So immediately his own officials turned against him. His defense minister said, quote, they tied our hands behind our backs and sold the homeland. Damn the rich man and his gang. So, and then, and what happened is that I explained that the media outlets that had supported Ashraf Ghani, they lavished praise on him. He was their poster boy, a disciple of Francis Fukuyama. He was the Afghan Milton Friedman. They loved him. And immediately they turned on him because it was such bad marketing of him stealing $169 million and fleeing the country. So the media turned on him and tried to put the blame on him and say that he was just a corrupt rogue agent. But he was not a rogue actor. Ashraf Ghani was product, a product of the United States, created by the United States. And I'm going to talk more about that now. Here's the photo of Ghani at the NATO summit in 2016 in Warsaw, Poland. You can see on the left here is the UK defense minister, Michael Fallon. Then there's Obama. And behind him is, the, is Ash Carter, the, the then US defense secretary. And then you can see to the left of Ashraf Ghani is the so-called CEO of Afghanistan, Abdullah Abdullah, more on that in a second. And then finally, the NATO Secretary General, um, Jen Soltenberg. More on, more on that later, because literally, I'm not joking. This is not a joke. Literally, there was a position created in Afghanistan in the puppet regime created by the U.S. called the CEO of Afghanistan. And here is a photo. So what happened is that Ashraf Ghani... This corrupt puppet, I'll, get, I'll talk more about his story. He basically helped steal the election in 2014. He was Washington's preferred candidate, a neoliberal technocrat who would implement the Washington consensus and privatize everything. This was after Hamid Karzai had lost the support of the United States. So they had a falling out. As I mentioned, he went in so far as to, to say that the U.S. was supporting ISIS in, in, in Afghanistan. And so Karzai had a falling out with the U.S., they, they had a new puppet, which was Ashraf Ghani, but they had a problem. Ashraf Ghani in the 2014 election in June, there was so much fraud that happened that, that they couldn't say that he fairly and freely won the election. So they had to do a, a, a puppet. They had to, sorry, they had to have a power sharing agreement. So what happened is that they sent John Kerry into Afghanistan to broker a deal. And by the way, here is an article in the New York Times, European Union confirms wide fraud in an Afghan presidential runoff election. So this is from December 2014. The runoff election that Ashraf Ghani supposedly won was June 2014. This is, again, the New York Times, the, the mouthpiece of the U.S. government. And they say, a new report by Europe, the European Union electoral observers supports some of the most stark estimates of systemic electoral fraud in the Afghan presidential runoff election in June. It says an earlier, an earlier audit of vote, voting invalidated only a small fraction of suspect votes. By the way, the earlier audit that was done back by the U.S. and the, the United Nations that was the one that said that Ashraf Ghani won, they're now admitting that that was a totally bogus audit and that the election was just stolen by Ashraf Ghani. And this, it says, the again, this is a report from European Union electoral observers, some of the most neoliberal technocrats on earth. These are not like anti imperialists by any stretch of the imagination. They're neo colonialists who supported the colonial occupation and they of Afghanistan. And they, they probably supported Ashraf Ghani, he was their guy. And here's the article continues the EU electoral observers they found in their report that more than two million votes representing a quarter of the total votes cast in the 2014 presidential election came from polling stations with voting irregularities. So, and then they said reports of widespread fraud led to a political crisis, crisis pitting the two candidates, Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah against each other. And then what happens is Secretary of State John Kerry helped broker a power sharing deal in which Mr. Ghani was named president and Abdullah was named the government 
chief executive. Again, this is not a joke. The the kleptocratic, corrupt puppet regime in Afghanistan created by the U.S. was so cartoonishly neoliberal. They literally created a new position, and the Obama administration was like, "Uh, what are we going to call this position from this other guy who's going to share power, quote unquote, in scare quotes, with the puppet who just stole the election in, in a fraudulent in an election in which over one quarter of the votes were fraudulent. And we know that he stole the election, Ashraf Ghani, but we have to have some kind of democratic marketing on this regime. So let's create a whole new, a whole new position. And they were so neoliberal, these technocrats in the Obama administration who have never talked to a working class person in their lives, who have spent all their, their lives like in in a laboratory, like this DC, this this Washington laboratory where they, they can they can't they can't take a step out. And the only time they can go take a step out is to like go have drinks with the ambassador of the UAE or something. Like they're just such they're they're just like they're not human beings. They're they they are reptiles, proverbially. And they were so neoliberal that they said, okay, let's create a new position and what are we going to call it? Let's call it CEO of Afghanistan, the, the chief executive officer of Afghanistan. And here in this photo of the fake smile of the neo-colonial officer, John Kerry, U.S. Secretary of State, with his new his two colonial subjects on the right, Ashraf Ghani, the US, U, former U.S. citizen turned puppet president, and on the left, CEO Abdullah Abdullah. So, I mean, to me, this episode says so much about the U.S. neocolonial occupation of Afghanistan and what it meant, this neoliberal puppet regime. So anyway, let me continue here. So Ashraf Ghani, where does this guy come from? There's a photo of him at the NATO summit. Before he became president in 2014, he was a literal U.S. citizen. And I explain in this article, he was made in USA. He was born into a wealthy and influential family in Afghanistan. His father worked for the Afghan monarchy, and they were very well collect, connected, but he immediately left his homeland when he was a young man. So what happened is that in, and, and I say before the U.S. invasion in October 2001, so after 9-11, Ghani had spent over half of his life outside of Afghanistan. He had actually spent more of his life living in the United States than he had ever spent in Afghanistan. He was a U.S. citizen until 2009. And he had to renounce his citizenship only so he could run for president in 2009, in which he was crushed, by the way, more on that later. So as I say, his, a look at his life story shows how he was gestated in a petri dish of elite U.S. institutions. It began with his education. He, he went to high school in Oregon in the United States, and he graduated in 1967. And then he went to the American University in Beirut, quote, American university. Keep that in mind. This is this is like the these are the elite westernized neoliberal pro-imperialist elites in Lebanon. And as the New York Times put it, he, Ashraf Ghani, when this is he was in his 20s at the time, he quote, enjoyed the Mediterranean beaches, went to dances, and he met his Lebanese American wife, Rula Ghani. Again, keep in mind, Lebanese American. His wife was a US citizen. And then in 1977, Ghani moved to the United States where he spent the next 24 years of his life. So at, at that time, he was still in his 20s. So he spent half of his life in the United States. And then he completed a master's degree and a PhD at the elite New York City Ivy League School, Columbia University. And what was his field? Anthropology, which I, as I point out, was thoroughly and still is thoroughly infiltrated by the CIA and the Pentagon. Don't, don't want to trust me? Here is a book by someone that I'm going to bring on sometime to have an interview over at Modern Rebels with Max, David H. Price. He is an anthropologist, but a, one of the few good ones. This is his book published by Duke University Press. It's called, quote, Cold War Anthropology, the CIA, the Pentagon, and the Growth of Dual Use Anthropology. And this is the quick summary of the book. In his book, David H. Price offers a provocative account of the profound influence that the American security state has had on the field of anthropology since the Second World War. Using a wealth of information unearthed in CIA, FBI, and military records, 
he maps out the intricate connections between academia and the intelligence community and the strategic use of anthropological research to further the goals of the American military complex, i.e. the U.S. empire. So he also says that anthropologists were used to shape global, global counterinsurgency and development programs that furthered America's Cold War objectives. So Ashraf Ghani is a perfect example of this, someone who was gestated in the bowels of fermented in the bowels, like a, like a, a nice 100-year-old wine of the elite academia university system in the United States. He went to Columbia University studying the CIA infiltrated anthro anthropological discipline, and he became one of Washington's main assets. Immediately after, he got elite university jobs at the University of California, Berkeley, and Johns Hopkins, another major hub for U.S. intelligence, by the way, Johns Hopkins. And he became a regular fixture on British state media. He became a leading commentator on BBC, and specifically the BBC, uh, the Dari and Pashto services, which are focused on Afghanistan and are very closely linked to Western intelligence. And then, as if that weren't suspicious enough, in 1985, Ashraf Ghani got a prestigious Fulbright scholarship where he studied where at Islamic schools, madrasas, madrasas in Pakistan. So as, as if you didn't already have the red light of CIA agent just flashing as, as brightly as possible, he went to go study in Islamic schools in Pakistan with a U.S. government-funded Fulbright. And then in 1991, he left academia to, to go to one of the only institutions that could possibly be more neoliberal, and that is, drumroll, the World Bank. Actually, I shouldn't do drumroll. I should do like, dun, 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 or like the, like, like the Beethoven, uh, or, or even more, I should do like the, like the psycho. Every time someone mentions the World Bank. So Ghani worked at the World Bank for a decade, and there he implemented neoliberal structural adjustment programs that he imposed largely in the global south, but also on the former Soviet Union. In fact, I want to mention a little fact here. He Later on, as I'll explain, uh, Ghani, he, he created his own think tank. I'll explain that in a second. But in an official bio he published explaining his work at the World Bank, he explained that he, quote, worked directly on the adjustment program of the Russian coal industry. That is that after the pillaging by, by capitalist oligarchs of the former Soviet Union, in which literally millions of Russians died, and the life expectancy of Russia in the years after the overthrow of the Soviet Union, the life expectancy for men dropped by several years. Well, Ashraf Ghani, this neoliberal puppet who became the president of Afghanistan, he was part of that project. And he wrote in this think tank, that he wrote as an article he published at the think tank he created. In 2005, he wrote, quote, in the 1990s, Russia was ready to become democratic and capitalist. That is to say that, that Russia was being held at the barrel of a gun of the U.S. empire and was forcibly the U.S. was forcibly imposing neoliberal shock therapy. And Ashraf Ghani said, quote, I had the privilege of working in Russia for five years during that time. So for me, this says so much about who this puppet was. He was a neo-colonial administrator who was installed into power through a fraudulent election on behalf of the U.S. empire, and he ruled the country as a Chicago boy, privatizing everything, implementing neoliberal reforms, and he did so with the total domination of these U.S. NATO military colonial forces, and he implemented the same structural adjustment neoliberal programs that he had learned at the World Bank back in his homeland. And here's another example of this. This is from WikiLeaks. So WikiLeaks published this cable. This is from 2009, early in the, the colonial military occupation of Afghanistan. And, and WikiLeaks points out that, quote, privatization, let me go back, privatization of, this is, quote, privatization of public enter, enterprises, end quote, in Afghanistan was among the, the key, quote, reforms demanded by the International Monetary Fund in exchange for financial support. So I have a, I have a link from this here that the, the 
cable published, it's from the US State Department, it was published by WikiLeaks. It shows that in 2009, that in order for so-called aid, this is, this is the time of the Karzai government, in return for so-called aid to the puppet regime, well, actually, Karzai was becoming too independent for the U.S.'s tastes. So in return for the so-called aid, the, the U.S.-controlled IMF demanded, quote, deeper financial and structural reforms, which included, quote, improving domestic revenue generation. It's a nice way of saying increasing taxes on poor people, as well as privatization of public enterprises. So this was the program. It was It's the same program that, that the U.S. empire always implements. They overthrow a regime, they install a puppet regime, which immediately privatizes everything so Western corporations can get access to that, so they can make a pretty penny, and then they can they can just say that this was a, a great uh, a model, that the Afghan moderate government under Ashraf Ghani is a model that we can implement in other parts of the global south. That was their goal. And this is a goal going back to the mid 2000s. So let's continue this story here because it's really an instructive story. I mean, Ashraf Ghani was made in a laboratory, basically. So thanks to Washington's undying support, he began to work his way up the political totem pole. By 2005, he made a technocratic rite of passage, passage and delivered a viral TED talk, which where he promised to teach his audience, quote, how to rebuild a broken state. And look at this photo of him. I mean, look, I'm not going to lie and say that like, I'm not, I'm not, not, I'm not like the least nerdy people. Like I have nerdy elements of me, but look at this dude. This is like one of the worst nerds on earth. He's like a walking stereotype of nerds. Look at this guy. He has his, his pants for people. I'm going to post this as a podcast after for people who are just listening. Ashraf Ghani has like his jeans up past like with his belt up past his belly button it's like it's like half of his body or more than half of his body is taken up by his jeans and he has like this this shirt that's like all wrinkled and behind him he has like these bricks that they used to call laptops i mean they're like back like you know back in the early 2000s and he just looks like a horrible nerd and he's speaking at this ted talk right and it's like the, some of the most just unintelligible unintelligible neoliberalese that you can imagine. I mean, as, as I say, the lecture, it, it, it echoed the end of history argument of Francis Fukuyama. And in his, in his argument, uh, Ashraf Ghani in his TED Talk said that capitalism triumphed. It has dominated the world. And it, it, it's, not, it's not a question anymore of whether we're going to have capitalism or socialism. Instead, the question he said in his TED Talk is, quote, which form of capitalism and which type of democratic participation. And then he said, we quote, we have to rethink the notion of capital. And he invited the listeners to quote, mobilize different forms of capital for the project of state building. And that same year in 2005, he wrote an article for his neoliberal, just walking stereotype of, a, of, a, of like a, just a, a technocratic DC think tank. I mean, it's basically a joke called the Institute for State Effectiveness. I mean, you could like put certain words like in one of those like bingo, you know, like when people like in an old folks home when they play bingo and they like they put all the or like uh, the lottery, right? They like put all the numbers in like one of those big balls and then they roll it and they stop it and they pull out some numbers. You could do that. with, But instead with numbers, you could have words like statecraft and a uh, policy making and democracy, and studies, and you could put all those words in one of those balls and just and just roll it around and pull out four words and get a name for a think tank, and that would be the name of 90% of the think tanks on K Street in Washington, but Institute for State Effectiveness is, State Effectiveness is probably the most absurdly neoliberal. And anyway, so Ashraf Ghani created this, this neoliberal think tank, and he wrote this article there, called Global Compact or Divided World. And in it, he said, quote, praising the center right, he said, quote, the center right has made a unique contribution in the last 60 years in rethinking the order in which 19, order, which in 1945 looked increasingly extremely threatened. He's saying that during the first Cold War, 
that there were a lot of socialist movements and revolutionary movements that were threatening capitalism and imperialism. But he's saying now, fortunately, thanks to the center right, there is now a consensus on democracy and on capitalism. That is, that is what he says. He says, we have to consolidate the consensus of democracy and capitalism. It, that, that, that really that encapsulates the, the worldview of Ashraf Ghani, this U.S. puppet. And as he said here, also in this, in this article he wrote in 2005 at this neoliberal think tank, he said that, that the solution to the problems in the world is not redistribution of wealth. It's not ending inequality. It's not giving health care and free education to people. It's not a job guarantee. It's not a strong social safety net. It's not, it's not with the state. It's with the market. The, the almighty free market can solve all problems. And his solution is that we have to, quote, we have to defend the, quote, fragile consensus around both democracy and capitalism. And, of course, his proposed solution to defend that fragile consensus of democracy and capitalism is bolstering imperialism, is strengthening institutions like the World Bank. He says it very explicitly in this article he wrote in 2005. He says, quote, the best route to consolidation is along the path of inclusion. Here, Europe can be positioned as a global catalyst and mediator with four roles to play. The first is to inject new vitality into NATO, the World Bank, the UN, and regional organizations. NATO took its first mission outside Europe in my country, Afghanistan. This is an, ex an incredibly important departure. It must become part of a global effort. But the World Bank, the UN, and other multilateral organizations await revitalization. This is an incredible line. This is basically him calling for NATO to expend you to continue to expand its neo-colonial domination of basically the world in order to maintain so-called democracy and capitalism. This is the worldview of these neoliberal technocrats that the wash that Washington puts into power as its puppets who are trained in elite U.S. universities. Literally, their worldview stated explicitly, slightly translated out of their euphemism, euphemistic neoliberalese. What they're saying is that our goal for the world is we want NATO to occupy countries to create so-called capitalist democracies. Emphasis on capitalism, not emphasis on democracy. Because as we saw in Afghanistan, there was no democracy. He stole the election in 2014 with the, with the rubber stamp of approval from the U.S., and his regime collapsed within days without U.S. support. Their goal for the, for the global South is NATO neocolonial domination and then the World Bank imposing neoliberal structural adjustment to create, quote, effective statecraft, as he says it. That is the goal of this U.S. puppet. I mean, it's, it can't be any more explicit. And, of course, this is a corrupt puppet also at the same time who stole $169 million from his country as he fled in disgrace. So it also says a lot about this guy who was a U.S. citizen until 2009, who spent almost half of his life in the United States. And it says a lot about these puppets, what they really are at the end of the day. They're just corrupt capitalists. All they care about is themselves. All they care about is getting rich and, and plundering their country and selling out their country and stealing and being traitors. That's a definition of, of treachery. But I should point out, by the way, that the so-called international community, TM sign, all those neoliberals, those technocrats, they were so in love with this corrupt puppet Ashraf Ghani that in 2006, he was declared a major candidate for the head honcho of the United Nations, the so-called secretary general in 2006. So this is a guy who was... He was the poster boy, the golden boy of the Western elite. And I, I point out here that, that the BBC described him with three words, a reformer, a technocrat, and incorruptible. Don't laugh. Because there were many media outlets that, re that repeatedly referred to him, him as incorruptible. The New Yorker re referred to him as incorruptible and said he was, a quote, a visionary technocrat who thinks 20 years ahead. Reuters insisted as recently as 2019 that, quote, even critics see President Ashraf Ghani as incorruptible and erudite. And 
CIA create, created U.S. state media outlet Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, referred to him finally as a leading reformer. Again, this is a guy who fled his country in disgrace, stealing $169 million. This is the guy that the, the Western corporate media loved. They called an incorruptible reformer. And who helped create him in Washington? These think tanks, these elite organizations like the Atlantic Council, one of the most powerful forces in Washington, which is funded by many Western governments. It's funded by the United Arab Emirates, by the way, that gave so-called refuge asylum to this corrupt criminal Ashraf Ghani. The Atlantic Council is funded by the weapons industry, by the oil industry. It represents the interest of all the corporations that profit from neoliberal puppets like Ashraf Ghani when they come to power and privatize everything. And here is Ashraf Ghani with Madeleine Albright receiving the Distinguished Leadership Award of the Atlantic Council. More on that in a bit. I say here in my article that for NATO, Ghani was the perfect neo-colonial administrator, a fluent English speaker who was always hypersensitive to what his imperial patrons wanted to hear. He could hobnob with blue-blooded Western bigwigs in an expensive suit one night, and then the next day dressed in traditional garb and appeal to his heritage as a Pashtun, a member of the largest ethnic group in Afghanistan and the social base for the Taliban. This is an important point because he, as you see in this photo of him with the neo-colonial administrator, John Kerry, he took this, when he became president in the, in the stolen election in 2014, he, he tried to rebrand himself. I'm sure he had a bunch of PR campaigns in Washington help him with this. And he started wearing traditional clothing because everyone knew that he was a, an elite, out-of-touch, corrupt, neoliberal technocrat who was a U.S. citizen until 2009. So he tried to portray himself as a man of the people. And he put on traditional clothing and said, I'm one of you. I'm also a Pashtun, even though he was not one of them because he was a corrupt millionaire oligarch who ended up stealing from his country at the end of the day. But, of course, that didn't stop the New York Times. The New York Times, the U.S. government's de facto mouthpiece, claimed that Ghani had found the seat spot, the sweet spot bet between being a, quote, technocrat and a populist. So this really says so much about Ghani. As I write, Ghani was really a contemporary emperor with no clothes, and his U.S.-created government was a house of cards that quite literally could not survive a single week without thousands of foreign troops profiting it up. So I'm not going to go through my full article here. It's going to be published soon over at the Gray Zone. But I'm just going to mention a few more things. I mentioned this earlier, that there was rampant corruption going on and that the U.S. spent $2.3 trillion in Afghanistan and over $2 trillion of that went into the pockets of private for-profit companies, including the top five military contractors, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing, Boeing and Northrop Grumman, who made a lot of by the way, a lot of Americans, very rich, former U.S. government officials, very, very rich. And in my, in my article, I point out that I mentioned this briefly last week, but I'm going to mention a few other things, that, that after the U.S. government pulled out of Afghanistan, or at least began the pullout, Washington's internal oversight office, the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, SIGAR, S-I-G-A-R, published a report and the report acknowledged, quote, pervasive corruption and, quote, rampant corruption in the U.S. created puppet regime. Again, this is the regime created by Washington, and they acknowledged that there was pervasive and rampant corruption in their own puppet regime. This is, a, this is the report, by the way, where they also admit that, quote, all war-related costs for the U.S. efforts in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan over the past 20 of the past two decades are estimated to be 6.4 trillion dollars say that like like mr evil with your with your you know your uh pinky up to your mouth 6.4 trillion dollars that's what they spent according to the u.s government itself but i want to point out by the way that ashraf ghani's corruption was well known by his imperial patrons in washington this was not a surprise to them even though the corporate media and the think tanks were selling him as a as a reformer and a technocrat and a genius. They knew he was corrupt. And it wasn't just the fact that he fled Afghanistan with $169 million in the, in the last, in the 11th hour. It was also this article that I want to talk about, which is very important. 
I briefly mentioned this last week. I'm not going to go into it too much, but I just want to talk about it. This is titled How Afghanistan's Brother, or sorry, Afghanistan's President, Ashraf Ghani, helped his brother and a U.S. contractor secure a lucrative mining, a lucrative mineral processing permit. So this shows how Ashraf Ghani, it says, with a figurative stroke of a pen, President Ghani put his sibling into the chromite business with a tarnished U.S. defense contractor. It shows how this Virginia company linked to the U.S. military, founded by these U.S. military personnel, linked to all of the corrupt special operations forces that were doing mining operations in Afghanistan, that they were given exclusive access to mines in Afghanistan by Ashraf Ghani. And Ashraf Ghani's brother just so happened to be one, a major shareholder in a subsidiary, Southern Development, which was given rights to produce artisanally mined ore. And they ran a mineral processing plant in the outskirts of Kabul. This was published in April. This corruption was well known before he fled and stole $169 million. The U.S. was, they knew it. They, they turned a blind eye to this corruption. I mean, a lot of the people in the U.S. government were actually involved in the corruption. They made money on it. They didn't even need to turn a blind eye. But among those who believed in, and that they, so, they were supposedly bringing freedom and democracy and all that ridiculous propaganda, they turned a blind eye to the propaganda because Ashraf Ghani was their guy. He was a U.S. citizen who was created by them, trained by them, who was a deep, true believer in neoliberalism, who worked at the World Bank and who wanted the Washington consensus for his country and let Western corporations just, just run roughshod over all his country and take over everything and control and, and tap into the $1 trillion of mineral reserves in Afghanistan. So they were all corrupt and they knew it, but it was these elite think tanks in Washington that helped create Ghani. And there are a few think tanks we can talk about. One of them, for instance, is the Brookings Institution, which is one of the most cartoonishly neoliberal think tanks. The head of foreign policy research, Michael O'Hanlon, published an article in the Washington Post in 2012 in which he lauded Ghani as, quote, an economic wizard. Of course, Ghani was the neoliberal finance minister right after he was whisked away, after immediately after the U.S. military occupation began in October 2001, Ghani went over to Afghanistan in December, and immediately in 2002, he was made finance minister, and he began implementing all those neoliberal reforms that, that he had learned at, at the World Bank. And one of the chief organizations that fostered his rise from a lowly finance minister to the head of state the chief colonial administrator for, administrator for the U.S. puppet regime was the Atlantic Council. And as I point out here in my article, there were just 16, there were 16 accounts that Ashraf Ghani followed on Twitter when he fled Afghanistan in disgrace, stealing $169 million. Let's look at what those, those accounts, were, accounts were. Here again, this is officially Ashraf Ghani's uh, Twitter account. 16 accounts. Here we go. He follows other people, the acting president. He followed the CEO of Afghanistan, Abdullah Abdullah, and other people in the Afghan government, uh, excluding the Afghan government and excluding the head of NATO, the general secretary, and excluding Narendra Modi, the prime minister of India. He followed a few other people, a journalist at the BBC, another journalist, and he followed his ambassador. He followed Fareed Zakaria, the mainstream media reporter. And here we go. He followed NATO, the Munich Security Conference, which is sponsored by NATO, and drumroll, the Atlantic Council. The Atlantic Council, I mean, th this actually says a lot. Looking at the people he followed, it says a lot about these corrupt, cartoonish, neoliberal technocrat, these puppets, because these are the people that, that were his influences that were his protectors, his sponsors, his advisors, Fareed Zakaria, so CNN, the CIA news network, NATO, the Atlantic Council, the Munich Security Conference, and NATO, again, the Atlantic Council being chief among them. So the Atlantic Council helped create who he was. And as I point out in my article, that back in April 2009, when, when Ghani was the neoliberal finance minister, 
sorry, this is actually um, no, no, no. This was after this was after he was finance minister. He did a, a, a fawning interview with the president and CEO of the Atlantic Council, Frederick Kemp. Kemp, the head of the Atlantic Council, revealed that they had been close friends since 2003. And he said, when I came to the Atlantic Council, we built an international advisory board of sitting chairmen and CEOs of globally significant companies and former cabinet members of key countries, including the United States. And he said, I was determined to have Ashraf Ghani. And not only on the international advisory board of the Atlantic Council, also he made Ashraf Ghani a member of the strategic advisors group of the Atlantic Council and the Obama administration, which was like peak neoliberalism. I mean, it just, just again, Ashraf Ghani was like made in a laboratory. So was Obama. Obama is just like him. He was, he's the American equivalent of like just in a, an elite technocratic neoliberal who was put into power and just did everything the empire wanted and Wall Street wanted. And the Atlantic Council helped to create policy for the Obama administration. It, it was it was like an outsourced arm for policymaking. And there was a revolving door, by the way, after the Obama administration left our left left office, a lot of people who then had uh, during the Trump administration had been out of government, they actually joined the Atlantic Council while they were waiting to return to the next Democratic administration. And now they left the they went from the Obama administration to the Atlantic Council, and then they went to the Biden administration, and they're now in the State Department or the Pentagon or wherever. And this, this, as I point out in my article, it shows in this interview that that Frederick Kemp, the head of the Atlantic Council, and Ashraf Ghani worked together to create the Barack Obama administration's strategy for Afghanistan. He said that it was in that capacity as a member of the strategic advisors group of the Atlantic Council that Quote, we talked about how the long-term goals weren't really known. For all the resources we were putting into Afghanistan, the long-term goals were not obvious. At that point, we came up with the idea that there had to be a 10-year framework for Afghanistan. Little did we, did we know that we were developing and implementing strategy because it was always thought to be implementing strategy, but suddenly we had an Obama plan. And the Obama plan was published under that name in 2009 at the Atlantic Council. And who who wrote it? Whose name was on it? Drum roll, Ashraf Ghani, the US puppet. The US really got their money out of this investment, out of this guy, the Afghan Milton Friedman. So here is the Atlantic Council report published in 2009. It was, I mean, very, very, very uh, creative name. Quote, a 10 year framework for Afghanistan executing the Obama plan and beyond. So Ashraf Ghani, I mean, he was one, he was really one of the main figures in the puppet colonial regime created in Afghanistan over the past 20 years. He, he won the, he won power in 2014 through the stolen election through fraud. So he was president officially from 2014 to 2021. And before that, he was foreign. He was sorry. He was finance minister. But even when he wasn't, when he when he had a falling out with Karzai and was forced to resign as finance minister, even in the years between that, he was playing a key role in helping to develop U.S. government policy for the colonial occupation of Afghanistan. And what what was his plan? What did he want to see his former homeland turned into? He wanted to see it turned into. As he said explicitly in the articles he wrote in his neoliberal think tank, the Institute for State Effectiveness, as he said explicitly in his 2005 neoliberal TED talk, he wanted Afghanistan to be a pet project of a NATO colonial occupation for other neoliberal technocratic regimes that could be implemented throughout the global south. That was the project. Afghanistan was going to be the pet project for the U.S. empire to remake the global South in its image as neoliberal capitalist, so-called democracies, it, of course, was not dem democratic. They say democratic, but they just rigged the elections and put the, who they wanted into power. And how do we know that? All you have to do is look in the 2009 election. In 2009, Ghani renounced his U.S. citizenship so he could run for president. 
The Financial Times, the voice of the British capitalist class, described him favorably as, quote, the most westernized and technocratic of all the candidates standing in the Afghan elections. And in his presidential campaign, who did Ghani hire to help him run his campaign to win Afghans' votes? It, of course, wasn't an Afghan who he hired to try to win over Afghan votes. He hired one of the chief American political strategists, James Carville. Anyone who knows anything about the Democratic Party, they've heard his name. James Carville was one of the chief strategists for the successful presidential campaign of Bill Clinton. And he also helped run the unsuccessful presidential campaigns of John Kerry and Hillary Clinton. So that says everything to me that when he ran for president in 2009, Ghani, his immediate thought was, I'm going to get this Democrat neoliberal political strategist in Washington to try to, to try to do an election campaign in Afghanistan, a country James Carville had never been to and knew nothing about. But that was the, the that was the strategy. That was the name of the game. It was create a neoliberal style, American style political and economic system in Washington, in sorry, in Kabul, in Washington's image, to create a system in Kabul in Washington's image. And Ashraf Ghani was the guy to do that. Hamid Karzai at first, Washington at first thought that Hamid, Hamid Karzai could Hamid Karzai could be their puppet who would do it on their behalf, but he was not reliable. He was not a reliable puppet, and they, they, they had a falling out with Karzai. So they installed, they installed uh, Ashraf Ghani through a, the stolen election in 2014. They created the power-sharing agreement with the CEO of Afghanistan, Abdullah Abdullah, and they created their neoliberal technocratic regime. How do we know that Ashraf Ghani was, was hated by the Afghan people? Well, in 2009, he got less than 3% of the vote, just over 2% of the vote. He was crushed. He came in fourth place. So it was obvious that Ashraf Ghani, I mean, like I said, in 2014, he was advised by the technocratic advisors. He, as you can see in this photo with the neo-colonial administrator, John Kerry, he started trying to rebrand his image. He called himself a populist. He started speaking more, less in English and more in Pashto. He started trying to, you know, use like idioms and and try to win the approval of the of the people. But it was very clearly a cynical rebranding campaign. That's not who he was. It's not he was not co comfortable doing that. He was comfortable in Washington with his friends and think tanks, and that's why in 2009, when he was running an honest technocratic campaign as to who he really was. He got less than 3% of the vote because his constituency at the end of the day, Ashraf Ghani's constituency was not the Afghan people. It was the elites in policymaking circles in Washington and Brussels. Those were his real constituency. And that's why it says a lot that after he ran his, his brutally failed, miserable campaign where he was crushed like a banana under a, a steamroller, were all like, I mean, just totally crushed. What was the response of his friends in the Atlantic Council of Frederick Kemp, the president and CEO of the Atlantic Council? He said, he said to his friend Ashraf Ghani, quote, some people would say you ran an unsuccessful campaign. I would say it was a successful campaign, but you didn't win. That line says everything because they didn't care about the Afghan people. They didn't care about democracy. Their policy was the Washington consensus, was the Chicago boy style policy in Kabul. And Ashraf Ghani helped to mainstream it in 2009. And in 2014, with the stolen election, he was able to put it in power. The head of the Atlantic Council praised him as, quote, one of the most capable public servants anywhere on the planet and, quote, conceptually brilliant. And he noted that Ghani's talk would, would, quote, be thought provoking for the Obama administration because, again, it was the Obama administration with its revolving door with the Atlantic Council that was using the Atlantic Council and Ashraf Ghani to help to craft its policies, its strategy for Afghanistan. Ashraf Ghani was one of the most important figures in the neo colonial regime in Afghanistan. And right up until 2014, he remained an active member of the board of the Atlantic Council's elite international advisory board. He was a member of that board. 
And by the way, who else was, was on the Atlantic Council board in Washington with Ashraf Ghani? Well, you have the major U.S. imperial planner, Brzezinski, the father of the Taliban, the father of Al-Qaeda, who oversaw the pol policy as the, the national security advisor for Jimmy Carter to support the Mujahideen as part of the CIA. Brzezinski, who called it the Afghan trap, who said openly that, that it was an Afghan trap. We, we, quote, wanted to give the Soviets their Vietnam. They wanted to lure the Soviets into Afghanistan to give them a, a uh, an insurgency war against the, to bleed the Soviet army. And he, Brzezinski himself, is single-handedly, more than any other human being on earth, responsible for turning Afghanistan into a failed narco state and giving rise to the Taliban in the first place. And he was sitting there on the board with Ashraf Ghani for years, which to me says everything. These are the people, these are the elites who are really, those are the, they, they're the ones who look out for their own interests. Brzezinski and Ghani. And who else was working with them, by the way? The one of the apostles, one of the disciple, disciples of neoliberalism, Larry Summers, Lawrence Summers, who is the head of Harvard. He was the chief economist of the World Bank, in which he wrote this infamous, this, this disgustingly racist memo in which he said that Western imperialist countries should export their, their waste, their garbage to the global south, because according to neoliberal capitalist economics, lives in the global south were not were not worth as much as lives in the global north in rich capitalist countries. Look that up. It was called the, the Summers Memo. Summers was also a main figure in the numerous, numerous Democratic administrations, especially the Obama administration. He helped oversee economic policy for the Obama administration. So these are two just uh, the imperial strategist and war criminal, Brzezinski, the neoliberal disciple Summers, they were both working with Ashraf Ghani, the, the Afghan puppet colonial administrator. Also joining them were billionaires like the Lebanese-Saudi billionaire art oligarch Baha Hariri, the right-wing media mogul Rupert Murdoch of Fox News fame. He was joining them. So again, Ashraf Ghani was a colleague of Rupert Murdoch. And who else was, was sitting there on the... Atlantic Council's International Advisory Board alongside Ashraf Ghani for years, for a decade, who is sitting on the board with him, the CEOs of Coca-Cola, Thomson Reuters, Blackstone, and Lockheed Martin. Those were the real constituency of Ashraf Ghani, not the Afghan people. Those are the people that he served in the neo-colonial puppet regime of that Washington ran of Ashraf Ghani in Kabul. So anyway, I'll start wrapping up here pretty soon because those are a lot of the main points. I just talk more on this article, which I'll publish at the Gray Zone and people who are interested, they can look into it. I talk about how the election was stolen and I talk about how in 2015, it was his moment of peak popularity. A year after he stole the election, Ashraf Ghani in March, he gave a speech to a joint session of Congress. He was celebrated as a hero who would use his free market magic to save Afghanistan once and for all after, uh, after Hamid Karzai, just, he just wasn't up for the game. He just proved himself not loyal enough of a puppet. And here's Hamid Karzai with bipartisan Congress members giving a standing ovation like they, like they did for, for the U.S. puppet and coup leader Juan Guaido when he visited. And you see Democrats and Republicans giving this U.S. puppet just a standing ovation. Here is an article that was published that same year in 2015 when Ghani, this was his peak popularity. He was really in the limelight. He was going to save Afghanistan, according to Washington. And th this, is what, this is what the think tankers in Washington were saying at the time. That August in 2015, the senior director of programs at the U.S. government-funded regime change organization, Democracy International, which is part of like the USAID, all the CIA front groups, he wrote in Foreign Policy in a puff piece, he said, quote, when Ashraf Ghani was elected president of Afghanistan, many in the international community rejoiced. Surely, a former World Bank official with reputation as a reformer was the right man to fix Afghanistan's most egregious problems and repair the country's standing internationally. There was no better candidate to bring Afghanistan 
into a new age of good governance and to begin to expand the rights and freedoms that have too often been denied to many of the country's citizens. That was the world, that was the view of the elite think tankers in Washington when he came into power in 2014 through the stolen election. And that's, it's not a coincidence that the same year in 2015 in April, the elite Atlantic Council awarded Ghani with its prestigious International Leadership Award for supposedly celebrating his, quote, selfless and courageous commitment to democracy and human dignity. Again, this is a guy who stole $169 million from his country. And I'm actually going to briefly here, I'm going to play a clip. And this is going to be a fun little clip from the Atlantic Council when he received the award. And you'll see it was none other than Madeleine Albright who was who gave the award at the ceremony. Surrounded by NATO officials, Madeleine Albright gave this award from a U.S. government-funded think tank that was used to create policy for the, for the Obama administration. The Atlantic Council gave an award to the U.S. puppet Ashraf Ghani. So let me share my screen here and make sure that the audio is being shared. Here is, this is Madeleine Albright awarding this U.S. puppet with the top award of the Atlantic Council. Here we go. But above all, he has offered hope to the Afghan people and to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to present the Atlantic Council's Distinguished International Leadership Award to a true statesman and a very dear friend, President Ashraf Ghani. So that, that video, I mean, it says so much. And at the award ceremony, Madeleine Albright celebrated Ashraf Ghani and said that he was a, quote, brilliant economist who, quote, had offered hope to the Afghan people and the world. Again, this guy stole $169 million from his country. And just like the, the poetic cherry on top, just the beautiful irony. You just can't make, make, can't make up stuff like this. At the ceremony, who was awarded this top prestigious award by the U.S. empire for being a, a loyal servant of the empire? Ashraf Ghani had finally made it. And who did he have to share the stage with? He shared it with the CEO of Lockheed Martin, his friend. Another figure was a top U.S. general and, drumroll, the right-wing country singer Toby Keith, <laughs> who performed at Trump's inauguration. And, of course, he made his, his, Toby Keith made his name screeching out jingoist musical threats, pledging to, quote, put a boot in your ass because, quote, it's the American way. So here's a photo of the Atlantic Council giving their awards and Ashraf Ghani couldn't attend, but his, his daughter attended. And a quick note on his daughter, by the way, because this is just so funny for me. This is just so poetic. Ashraf Ghani's daughter, who received the award on his behalf at the Atlantic Council, her name is Mariam. She is a stereotypical Brooklyn hipster artist, Radalib. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's hilarious. The daughter, would it surprise you to hear that the daughter of the neoliberal U.S. puppet neocolonial administrator, Ashraf Ghani, is a New York City-based artist who lives in a luxury Brooklyn loft apartment. Her personal Insta Instagram account shows a combination of minimalist art and rad lib politics where she appropriates anti-colonial buzzwords and defends Western poor foreign policy interests. And by the way, a funny quick note, she very much occupies the milieu, milieu of lefty regime change activists, so much so that in 2017, she participated in a panel discussion at New York University at its Kevorkian Center for Middle East Studies. And the event was called Arts and Refugees, Confronting Conflict with Visual Elements. And a lot at, on stage with her, alongside the daughter of Ashraf Ghani, was the notorious regime change lobbyist, Molly Crabapple, who we talked about who was a fellow at, at a U.S. State Department funded think tank, the New American Foundation. And she, her fellowship, Molly Crabapple's fellow, fellowship, is sponsored by the billionaire and former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt. So, and Mariam Ghani and Molly Crabapple also appeared in a 2019 artist compilation. So, I mean, that says everything. Like, the his daughter, who took his award on his behalf at the ceremony in 2015, is just is a Brooklyn Radlib. I mean, 
it, it, the poetic irony just can't get this sweet. It's just like Italian chef fingers. I mean, come on. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to wrap up. I know I said that already, but I'm really, I'm going to start getting to a conclusion here. But a few more just hilarious points because it says so much about Ashraf Ghani. In 2015, a year after he stole the election and became president, the Atlantic Council, under its, quote, New Atlanticist blog, titled a blog, published a, blo a blog post titled, IMF, colon, Ghani has showed Afghanistan is open for business. And it was about an event that the, that the Atlantic Council did with the IMF mission chief in Afghanistan, the, the, I, the IMF's top official in Afghanistan, who said to the Atlantic Council, he, he said that the, the, the victory of Ghani, who stole the election through fraud, quote, signaled to the world that Afghanistan is open for business and the new administration is determined to proceed with reforms. And the bureaucrat from the IMF said that they were, quote, optimistic about the long term under Ghani's leadership. Hilarious considering that the long term considers now that literally his regime collapsed in a week, in less than a week after the U.S. military withdrew. So there's a lot more in this article I, I, I go into. I talk about all the other corrupt think tanks supporting him and all of this. I mean, look at this. It's just so corrupt. In, in 2018, Ashraf Ghani gave a speech at the Munich Security Conference, which is sponsored by NATO. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. This was a diff different event. In 2018, Ashraf Ghani gave a speech at the NATO summit again after attending the 2016 NATO summit with Obama. He attended it again in 2018, and he celebrated. Of course, the Atlantic Council CEO and President Fred Kemp was there. And Ghani gushed to him, quote, you've been a great friend. I have great admiration for both your scholarship and your management. So they just continued to promote this guy right up until the end. Last year, still, they were doing, the Atlantic Council was doing events, just promoting Ashraf Ghani, saying, Afghanistan's great vision for peace, a conversation with Ghani. I mean, it really says so much about who this figure was. He was a neoliberal puppet of Washington. He was the Afghan Milton Friedman. And again, I'm just going to repeat this analogy that I said. That he was the poster boy for neoliberalism, a disciple of Francis Fukuyama, their very own Afghan Milton Friedman. Washington was so ecstatic with Ghani's reign in Afghanistan because it had finally found a new way to implement Augusto Pinochet's economic program, but without requiring the Chilean dictator's brutally violent fist. Of course, it was the U.S. NATO military occupation that acted as the replacement for Pinochet's death squads, torturers, concentration camps, and helicopter assassination camp, helicopter assassinations. But the distance between Ghani and his neoliberal protectors helped NATO market Afghanistan as a new model for capitalist democracy, one that could be exported to other parts of the global South. Ghani was their very own South Asian Chicago boy, educated and trained in the United States, who believed so deeply in the power of the almighty free market that he created his own Washington, D.C.-based think tank, hilariously called the Institute for State Effectiveness, whose slogan is citizen-centered approach to state and market and which was expressly dedicated to proselytizing the wonders of capitalism. And what I'll leave you all with is this final note here is on this note I talk about later on when I talk about his corrupt neoliberal think tank, the Institute for Statecraft, sorry, the Institute for State Effectiveness, rather, when I'm talking about this, that he was talking about the uh, corrupt, the totally just, neoliberal plans that they had for the global south and he wrote this book and i'm still working here on finishing this piece which is it's going to be published he wrote this book and it's called in 2008 he published a book called fixing failed states a framework for rebuilding a fractured world and what i'm going to conclude this stream with is just so funny when i found this it's so hilarious to me this is the book 
that Ashraf Ghani published in 2008 with Claire Lockhart, the another neoliberal think tank uh, pundit whose husband was working with the Obama, the Trump administration to oversee regime change policy against Venezuela and Syria. So she helped fund the the Institute for State Effectiveness with Ashraf Ghani. And this is the book they published in 2008, Fixing Failed States, A Framework for Rebuilding a Fractured World. I was reading through it and I literally, I opened the first page and just burst out in laughter. It was so funny because look who the first name that appears in this book before any text, before anything, the first blurb, who wrote it? None other than Francis Fukuyama, the, the king of neoliberal fraudulent ideology, a total neoliberal soothsayer, snake oil salesman. He is the first blurb in this book that was written by Ashraf Ghani, Fixing Failed States. And Francis Fukuyama just sings his praise and says, Ashraf Ghani is a practitioner turned theoretician drawing on his background at the World Bank and as the first post-Taliban finance minister of Afghanistan, he, along with Claire Lockhart, developed a comprehensive framework for understanding the problem of state building. He argues per persuasively that this will be the central challenge underpinning world order in our globalized age and offers practical solutions for meeting it. Well, just as Francis Fukuyama, who's totally fuel of shit, pardon my friends, French, just as he was totally wrong about everything he wrote after the overthrow of the Soviet Union and the socialist bloc, about the failure of socialism and the triumph of capitalism and imperialism, so too was Ashraf Ghani totally full of shit, totally wrong. By the way, look, look who else blurbed his book here. The vice chairman of Goldman Sachs, Robert Hormatz, who said that fixing failed states provides a brilliantly craft, crafted and extraordinarily valued analysis of what makes states fail and what makes them succeed. Everyone concerned about improved governance and particularly public officials at all levels and industrialized, emerging and developing nations alike will benefit enormously from reading this and studying the great insights it provides. And then finally, there's a blurb here from the hilariously named right-wing Peruvian Chicago boy economist Hernando de Soto, who I say hilariously named, ironically named, because she shares the name of a Spanish colonialist, Hernando de Soto. And, and he said of glowingly of Ashraf Ghani's book that it's important and timely, an important and timely alarm bell for the world's next crisis. We ignore their remedies at our peril. Yeah, the next crisis like Ashraf Ghani's fake puppet government literally collapsing in a few days. And I should I should hilariously point out that Hernando de Soto, this right-wing Peruvian economist who was a, a candidate in the most recent presidential election, he has a book called The Mystery of Capital, Why Capitalism Triumphs, triumphs in the West and Fails Everywhere Else. What he doesn't mention, of course, is imperialism. That's not, that's not even mentioned as part of his explanation for why capitalism fails in the global South because capitalism is predicated on imperialism and capitalism only works in scare quotes in the, the imperial core in the imperialist formerly colonizing countries in the global North because they exploit the global South. They exploit their labor. And I mean, it doesn't even work in the U S there's mass unemployment. There's mass inequality. There's no healthcare. There's over a trillion dollars in student loans and there's a huge, uh, not only a bubble of student loan debt, but a bubble of real estate debt and all of this. I mean, so capitalism, of course, doesn't even work in the imperial core, but it especially doesn't work in the periphery. And Ashraf Ghani's friends, these neoliberal right-wing economists, they, they just can't get that through their mind because they are true believers. And this is what I'm going to end with the stream with. This is the point that you should take away that, that, my reporting, which is going to be published at the gray zone, you got a sneak peek here. It shows how Ashraf Ghani is a true believer in neoliberalism. That's why the U.S. government helped to create him. That's why that he was immediately promoted to finance minister immediately right after he, he fled 
or he sorry, he returned to Afghanistan after living in the United States for 24 years from 1977. After fleeing Afghanistan in the 70s, he lived from in the United States from 1977 until 2001. He didn't return to his country, his birthland, until December 2001. He was immediately made finance minister by the U.S. puppet regime. He he tried to implement his neoliberal shock therapy that he learned at the World Bank. It was it was a total failure. He had a falling out with Karzai, and then the U.S. government brought him back in the stolen election of 2014, installed him into power as their colonial puppet, and he immediately tried to do the Chicago boy, Pinochet-style economic program, and it failed. It completely, miserably failed, as it has failed everywhere. It failed for the people of Afghanistan. It even failed according to the U.S. government's own metrics. It's such a classic stereotype, arch rather than not a stereotype, it's a classic archetype of these puppets that the U.S. government, the U.S. empire cultivates to serve in its interests. They're all fail sons. They're all, they, they can't do it because the reality is that the policies they think are going to save their country destroy their country because it's, just, it's political and economic snake oil. It's not real. It's an illusion. It's a fantasy to enrich the elite capitalist oligarchs, the billionaires who looted Afghanistan from those five top military contractors who made over a trillion dollars. And all the Beltway bandits who earned their, earned their names as the Beltway bandits in the war in Afghanistan, profiteering for all of the lanyard-wearing Cretans in K, on K Street in Washington, sitting in their air-conditioned offices, typing away in their think tanks funded by the arms industry and Western governments and monarchies like the UAE about why they need 10 more years, 20 more years, 500 more years of a never-ending colonial occupation of Afghanistan. Ashraf Ghani should stand out as the symbol of the rot at the heart of this regime constructed by the U.S. empire and by the European Union as well, which have they have so much blood on their hands as, as subsidiaries of the U.S. empire, junior partners of U.S. imperialism under the umbrella of NATO. They created Ashraf Ghani. They bear responsibility for this corrupt traitor who in disgrace fled his country, stealing the wealth of one of the poorest countries in the world, Afghanistan, stealing $169 million from some of the poorest people on earth. Well, he claimed to speak on their behalf. Well, he claimed he was going to bring them democracy at the barrel of a NATO gun. And of course, through Western corporations who were going to bring supposedly democracy through the free market. That was his program for his people. That was his elitist program to, to pull them into the 21st century of capitalism through neoliberal shock therapy, like he, like he did. He participated in, in the gutting of post-Soviet Russia. This is the criminal, the corrupt, just villain. He really is a villain that the U.S. helped to create and install into power in Afghanistan. And... For anyone who's crazy enough to, to have listened to all of this talk, I thank you for listening. I hope it was at least interesting, if not entertaining. I hope you learned something. Because for me, it just makes me angry. And concluding it, I mean, just, I don't see how people can't be angry. I get so angry about this. The looting of Afghanistan, of the Afghan people, of the trillion dollars of mineral reserves, the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Afghans, this is the real face of empire. Ashraf Ghani is one of their imperial foot soldiers. And the Afghan people should spit on his name for what he did looting their country. So I'm concluding my stream with that. I want to thank to everyone who is watching on Rockfin. And in the future, I will be doing similar streams here every single week at Rockfin. Thanks so much for joining us, joining me, and I'll see you next time here at Propaganda Today. Thanks a lot to everyone.